You're listening to the Tell Me series, a podcast that inspires people to rekindle their childlike curiosity about the world. My name is Rana Krupani, and I enjoy seeking discomfort, learning, and creating content that opens up new perspectives. And I'm sitting down with people to talk about their passions, the things they've learned, and how to implement them in our lives. This week's guest is a massive space enthusiast. He's the founder of the North Houston Space Society and of Countdown to the Moon, a podcast where he talks to strangers every day about NASA's mission to revisit the moon in 2024. I'm super excited to introduce one of the coolest people I know, Nathan Price. Nathan, welcome to the show. Well, thanks for having me. Uh, this is an amazing program you're putting together, and I feel so honored to be a part of it. Thanks. I appreciate it. Now, you've had more than, I think, is it 1,700 episodes on your podcast? Well... How did you first come up with the idea and what are some of the things you've learned along the way? Yeah, it's a, it's a bit of a confusing thing to look at, right? Because it's actually a countdown uh, and I started at 1840. So whenever you see like, uh, you know, 1232 or whatever uh, today's number is, uh, you're like, wow, he's done uh, 1,232 of them. Uh, actually, I've only done like 600. That's how many more I have to do. So... <laughs> Mm, okay, so it's a countdown from like the, you know, time to launch and you're going down all the way until that specific day. Yeah, and it's the, the inspiration and the timing are both related to one person. Uh, NASA was really focused on this 2024 date. They uh, hired a NASA associate administrator for their human exploration uh, and operation uh, division. And his name was Doug Laverio, mm -hmm. and he wanted to keep everybody focused on the 2024 date. So one of the things that he did was wear a lapel pin every day with the number of days till the end of 2024. And he was also highlighting a NASA person a day uh, who was contributing to the efforts to get us there in 2024. And so the, the combination of those two things led to the idea of, why don't we do a similar countdown, but interview everyday people to see what they think. So that's, that's how the framework mm -hmm. got created. That's amazing. I mean, I, I love the concept because it makes you look forward to putting out something every day. And you know that the closer and closer you get, you're going to get this other sort of satisfaction. Uh, what are some of the things you've learned throughout the journey? I think the number one thing I've learned is how generous people are uh, in terms of willing to participate and help uh, with a, a stranger who's doing a project. Uh, most of the people I interview uh, have mm -hmm. no interest in space. Uh, they do not know me. I, one of my interviewees uh, had uh, described it as sit down with tea for a stranger, uh, with a stranger, you know, which is kind of a neat way to, to put it. But, yeah. you know, people are willing to participate and help you out. And uh, I think there's so many things about society that makes us upset or gives us concern. Um, but one of the good things that we have in society is the vast majority of people actually look out for each other. And they're willing to help each other. So that's, that's the number one thing I've learned. The second thing I've learned is people are really smart. The problem is not mm -hmm. that they're not able to think about the world, but I think they're constantly being bombarded with the wrong questions. And if we start asking the right questions, we start getting better responses. They're constantly bombarded with questions like, mm -hmm. who are you going to use for your AT&T provider? Who are you going to vote for? Which is, uh, some people will say is very important. But at the same token, you know, it's not really going to affect your day-to-day -day life as much as, you know, how do you kind of relate to your fellow human being and, you know, kind of like your views about what's important in life and that type of thing. That's beautiful. I mean, I love the idea of reaching out to strangers because I personally subscribe to the notion that we are inherently good rather than inherently evil. And to me, a stranger is more like a potential new best friend because every friend I've had today was originally a stranger. The moment I kept that in my mind, I stopped thinking of being scared to approach someone new. And it was just like, I wonder what stories they have that I can learn from. It definitely. Uh, also, it's kind of interesting, uh, the inequalities around the world. I, I mean, like in terms of access to the internet, uh, bandwidth, the ability mm -hmm. to participate in, you know, kind of achieving the career goals that they have. Uh, this really varies a lot based upon uh, country to country. And you see some really remarkable people 
that will have to overcome great difficulties to even have a chance of achieving what they want. And then you see other people that sort of are bombarded by lots of opportunities and with just a little bit of effort, they can achieve what they want. In some ways, it's kind of saddening to, to see this. That's true. I mean, the good thing about space exploration in general is that it brings together people from all walks of life, right? You need diversity to be able to have more ways of solving those problems we face, right? There's no way we're pushing the boundaries of mankind if we don't have new ways of thinking about things. Absolutely. And, you know, one of my favorite um, recent space stories is around Rocket Lab. I, I don't know if you've heard about them. Mm -mm. No, I haven't. Well, uh, Rocket Labs is the second private company to actually launch something into orbit. And do you know where they were founded? If not in the U.S., I would assume either Russia, China, India, or like Israel. Oh, what if I told you New Zealand? No way. I've never heard anything about New Zealand in Think About Space. Yeah, there's this guy, uh, Peter Beck. He's the founder of uh, uh, Rocket Lab and their CEO. And uh, he wanted to... Uh, create rockets. And, you know, New Zealand's not known as being the forefront of uh, space. Uh, but, um, you know, he was determined mm -hmm. to make it happen. He was able to get the engineers together, build a rocket, uh, get it into space, and, and now they're a successful commercial uh, business. And what I like to tell uh, people who want to do space in countries that don't have, um, you know, kind of a, a rocket industry, uh, you know, our national space program is, you know, if New Zealand could do it, mm -hmm. you know, why can't you? <laughs> That's true. Actually, speaking of space exploration and different countries being involved, there are quite a few misconceptions about NASA when it comes to space. I think people overestimate NASA's budget. So for those who are listening, NASA actually gets 0.5% of the U.S.'s budget. 17% goes to the military. That's 30 times the amount NASA gets. Now, Nate, what would you say to people who think we should first solve problems on Earth before venturing into space? I, I would say that we have a lot of people sitting around talking about what other people should do, and they should all be contributing to actually getting <laughs> stuff done. That's so true. Uh, that I makes would sense. say I... that, uh, you know, the first time we went to the moon, we had about uh, 3 billion people on Earth, and now we have our 3.5. We now have about 7 billion people on Earth, so we have twice the number of brains and problem solvers. Plus, they're way more connected and empowered than they were before um, with the internet, personal computers. I mean, whenever Neil and Buzz were on the uh, moon, uh, the idea of remote control was a, was a small child sitting in front of the TV, uh, listening to the parents' commands on what to do with the TV. And their choice was uh, one of three stations. So uh, on, off, volume up, volume down, and station one, two, or three. That was pretty much all the controls you had for, for the TV. If you needed to look up something then, uh, either somebody around you knew it, or you had to go to the library and hope they had a book, or you had to put a request for a book to another library and wait weeks and weeks and weeks to get it back. Now people can Google <laughs> and learn anything they want. Uh, so we have twice the number of people who can do, you know, a thousand times more things and coordinate with millions of other people literally if something is important to you go do it you know uh you know don't sit around wondering why other people aren't doing it now, that's a very very good point you have there just to think the sheer number the perspective you you add to this is like i didn't realize personally that we've doubled like just the fact that we've doubled it we could have you know two nasas doing separate missions and still accomplish what we did way back. Um, I think many people don't know we can thank space exploration for a lot of the stuff we use today in our everyday lives. Uh, I'd like you to rank these five things from best to worst uh, from your point of view. These are all things that space exploration has helped us with. One, camera phones. The, that's right, the, the camera on your iPhone, NASA's been there. Uh, second, GPS. You use Google Maps all the time. Have you thought about where it comes from? Third, freeze-dried food. Fourth, home insulation. And fifth, memory foam. Well, uh, the GPS is definitely really uh, extremely useful. You know, being able to pinpoint your location any place on the, the Earth 
Now, I think that the important thing to realize is that GPS is basically a constellation of satellites sending a, a highly precise encoded message that tells you the time that the signal was sent and where the satellite was. And by getting the, the signal from three or more satellites, you're able to then triangulate your position on this uh, uh, the surface. But uh, then you really need like um, you know Google Maps to actually go and put yourself on the map. So it's definitely a fundamental technology, but I think if people just knew their longitude, latitude, and, and elevation, uh, they wouldn't get nearly as much value out of it as they uh, knew which street they were on and which street they had to go down. But uh, GPS mm -hmm. would definitely be towards uh, the top of the list. After that, I think, uh, you know, the camera phone uh, is um, really, really uh, useful. Uh, it's kind of scary on one hand. Um, you can't really do anything these days without being on film. Um, so used yeah. to, uh, back whenever I was in middle school and high school, um, you know, you make a mistake uh, or do something goofy or, you know, it became like a story that people told, but they wouldn't have the pictures to back it up or the, the video. Uh, so it kind of <laughs> faded. <laughs> it faded from memory. You ran on but street now, cred. <laughs> now, uh, you know, you do something that's kind of embarrassing and that meme, you live out there forever and ever and ever. And, you know, you, you walk up to random people on the street and they're like, oh, you're the guy that fell off the ladder into the, <laughs> you know, into the swimming pool and then, you know, or whatever. <laughs> uh, so I, I think that's kind of scary. <laughs> I mean, that's so true. But I guess on the flip side is there's so much new information being pumped out that whatever embarrassing moment you had will be replaced by another more embarrassing moment by someone else. Yes. Uh, you want to be popular, but not that popular, you know? <laughs> <laughs> exactly. There's, there's like a bell curve, you know? Like, where do you want to be at it? You don't want to really be on the extreme tail. Exactly. You know, after that, you mentioned uh, insulation. Insulation is really uh, important to keep the cold in and the heat out and then keep the heat in and the cold out. Uh, so that's... That's definitely up there. Uh, Freeze-dried food, you know, it, it's kind of a, a, a neat idea. Um, you know, NASA is trying to prepare food that will be able to uh, be safe and storable for years at a time. Uh, you know, mm -hmm. kind of uh, thinking ahead to maybe a, a two or three year mission to Mars and back. Uh, so when that, those astronauts launch, they'll essentially have every meal that they plan to eat the entire trip there. Now, if we could actually figure out a way to cheaply mass produce food that was good for multiple years at a time and kept that in storage and, and little depots around the world, I mean, you could imagine having uh, some type of catastrophe or something and, and be able to access that food. And at least we wouldn't have to worry about people going starving. And a memory phone, oh, that sounds good. So, but I would put that probably at the bottom of the list right now. <laughs> I mean, everyone wants a good night's sleep at the end of the day. Absolutely. That's fair. So I noticed we haven't gone really back to the moon, let's say in the past 50, 60 years, um, with a lot of media is focused on Mars today, like with the Perseverance and Curiosity rovers. Why is it so important that we go back to the moon specifically? Yeah, uh, so the last time we were on the moon was 1972, uh, so uh, 49 years ago. Uh, the first time we were on the moon was 1969. That was, uh, you know, 50, 52 years ago, I guess. Um, it's not so much important that we go back to the moon per se. Uh, what is important is that we um, uh, develop in-space infrastructure. We have essentially zero infrastructure in space, and that makes the cost of doing anything in space extremely prohibitive. Um, can you imagine if you were to take a trip uh, across uh, the United States and in order to make it from, you know, the East Coast to the West Coast, you had to carry all of your food, all of your water, all of your fuel with you and anything you might need. Uh, you couldn't stop at a gasoline station. You couldn't stop at a restaurant. Um, you know, that would make uh, that trip extremely expensive. But now I could just hop in my car without a moment's thought. I have payment infrastructure that lets me get money uh, to these different places. I could get a new fuel, I could get my car repaired, I can eat someplace, there's hotels to stay at. And so taking a trip becomes way more cheaper. What we need to do is develop in-space infrastructure that allows for us to do whatever we want to in space way cheaper than we can now. 
if we had uh, fuel depots and you know we were uh, mining materials and doing in-space manufacturing, that would uh, greatly open up and expand the realm of things we could do in space. And the moon is the closest thing to us. It's always, uh, you know, it took the Apollo astronauts three days to get there. So it's always at least three days uh, mm -hmm. away. Uh, and so infrastructure, I think, is the number one thing in my mind about why we should go back to the moon. But another thing is science. Um, the uh, sun has, um, you know, we, whenever you look at a kid's picture, they usually draw a little yellow sphere, uh, in one corner and that's the sun. <laughs> and I think yep. that's the picture we all have in our minds of what the sun is. It's just some bright thing up in the sky, but it's a very dynamic. Guilty of that <laughs> <laughs> from my younger ages. Even today, if you probably asked me like draw the sun, I'll put like a tiny corner, like semicircle right there. And then continue on. Yeah, I mean, uh, the, but the sun is a very complex, I mean, it's a huge um, uh, object. And it's very complex. It has weather. It has uh, cycles it goes through. It's emitting, um, you know, the, these, uh, we call them solar winds, you know, high energy particles that are coming out of it. Uh, occasionally, I mean, it's constantly having like parts of it flare up, uh, you know, the solar flares, uh, so, uh, various mm -hmm. sizes. and you know, this, the moon has no atmosphere. It has no weather. And um, essentially, the sun's um, material has been bombarding the moon over billions of years. And by analyzing the, the rocks and the meteors and the um, craters, uh, you know, you kind of start putting together a more precise picture of kind of uh, our sun over that longer period of time. And the the other thing is um, meteors are constantly hitting the earth. Like every hour of every day, if you look up in the sky uh, and it's dark enough, you can see a meteor, uh, you know, breaking apart in the atmosphere. But there's a whole bunch more that you can't see. And the vast majority of mm -hmm. meteors actually, uh, you know, burn up in the atmosphere. Um, the ones that don't, most of them uh, land in the ocean. And the ones that do land yeah. on land, uh, you know, make an impact, uh, but then, you know, get weathered over and grown over and you really don't see them. Well, since the, the moon's been traveling through the same volume of space as the Earth has for the past, uh, you know, millions and billions of years, um, a proportion of those same meteors have been hitting the moon's surface. But unlike the Earth, mm -hmm. the moon has uh, a record of them. Uh, you know, that's why you see all the craters uh, there. And, um, you know, there could be uh, potentially a, a lot of material that are in these very long thousand year, 2000 year, 3000 year orbits, which are too far away for us to detect right now. But by analyzing the moon's uh, surface and those craters, we might start seeing a pattern that every so often, you know, there's like these, these, um, meteors, these craters are developing in, in cycles. And those cycles might then correlate to this, this kind of um, material that's in orbit around the moon that comes around so much. And if we, we found mm -hmm. that, we could prepare for it. You know, um, we don't have to, to wait into the last moment. Uh, so those are kind of uh, some reasons we should definitely uh, study the moon. Also, on top of that, did you know the moon has ice? Yeah. Yeah, that, that was surprising when I found that out. But then sometimes it made me think about, like, why, why not? Like, if it's so close to us and we have water, then shouldn't it also have water? Like, Mars is found to have some water in, you know, obviously it's not, like, in its liquid state. But the fact that if Mars had it and we have it, then the moon's, like, in between. It should definitely, there should be a thought of, yeah, why not? Rather than, oh, that's a surprise. Yeah, indeed. But, you know, I mean, this, this uh, water ice are in these uh, permanently shadowed craters, and it's like colder than the surface of Pluto in these, these craters. So it's extremely, extremely cold. And I'm just wondering, other than the water, what else we might find there? I mean, because you got to imagine the, the asteroid that, you know, kicked up all the material that caused the sky to darken, that killed all the plants, that killed all the dinosaurs. Um, 
that maybe some of that material uh, made it into orbit around the Earth and eventually, you know, made it onto the moon's surface that might actually be preserved. Uh, and, you know, maybe yeah, there's Yeah, I mean, to me, to me, it seems like the moon is a perfect crime scene, right? And it's a never-changing crime scene because it has no weather, right? Earth got bombarded with all those meteorites, but then at the end of the day, nature took over and we grew over it. But the moon has like the same crime scene. It's just we're we're basically playing detective, trying to figure out what the heck happened and what could it mean for not just where civilization will go, but also is there life? And then are do we have the right components to creating life in other places? And you know, just discovering more things. So to me, it's just easier to picture a crime scene and be like, hey, this pattern's here. Have I seen this pattern in another planet or? Can we connect the dots in some way once we've seen the bigger picture? And, you know, people say, well, why go back to the moon? We've been there. We've done that. I mean, we did send uh, some highly trained astronauts uh, there. But, you know, they really weren't exploring. They were the, the hands and eyes of people back here on Earth who were telling them what to do. Uh, and, you know, as you mentioned about this program, it's like that childhood curiosity. You're trying to rekindle that. Mm -hmm. I mean, we, we need to send people to the moon that are just, they're not there to discover a certain thing because that focuses you down. They're there just to experience mm -hmm. it and look at what's there and ask questions, whatever those questions are. We need to send more people like that uh, to, to see what we don't see. I mean, can you imagine a fish in an aquarium having a conversation about, uh, you know, the universe? Uh, to them, the entire universe must be wet. You know that. Yeah, that, uh, that's true. <laughs> you know they they would not have any idea what uh, air was or what it meant to mm -hmm. to fly or, you know, I, I I imagine their world would be very different. And the thing that we got to realize is we are just as isolated and narrowly um, experienced as those fish. Our aquarium is just slightly bigger. You mentioned quite a few things on pushing the advent of exploration. And when I think of space in the private sector, like three names come to mind, right? Elon Musk, Jeff Bezos, and Richard Branson, at least recent time. From a space exploration point of view, what value do you find in what they're doing? Yeah, um, Richard Branson, you know, he has a suborbital uh, flight. Um, it, it, I, I think it would have been really cool if he had done it 10 years ago, <laughs> uh, but it's uh, a little <laughs> late now. So that's, that's, uh, that's a challenge. I don't think we'll see much out of Virgin Galactic in terms of um, big impact on, on space. Uh, Blue Origin, it's kind of an interesting thing. Jeff Bezos really has the vision. You know, he's a long-term space advocate. His um, high school valedictorian speech that dealt with um, building structures in space and the need to to develop in that direction. And, and Blue Origin was actually founded uh, slightly before SpaceX. So they actually had a little bit mm -hmm. um, greater start. And, um, you know, I mean, he definitely has been able to build successful companies before. But, you know, Jeff uh, Bezos doesn't really, is not really an engineer. And it doesn't seem he's been able to assemble the same uh, effective team with the same kind of ability to produce things as Elon has. Now, Elon, uh, he's really there on the, the front line, um, you know, developing new capabilities. His, his um, biggest one is, um, you know, the Starship, which he's actually building here in Texas, in Brownsville. You got to go down there in March to take a look at it. That's really amazing. Wow, um, that'll be exciting. Yeah, and what's really exciting about it is that every success will be the first 100% reusable spacecraft ever. Um, you know, planes and rockets cost about the same, but you go buy a ticket on a plane for, you know, a hundred bucks, you can buy a ticket on the rocket for the cost of the rocket. Um, so yeah. it's, it's, it's uh, not open up the same amount of um, travel options uh, as you have with planes. But whenever rockets now can be reused 100% over and over and over again, you start seeing them, uh, the, the model becoming more like charging for airplane uh, seats. 
Uh, so that's going to be a, a, a very good. And he's planning to use the same vehicle for point-to-point -point earth travel. So instead of us con you know, connecting uh, via Riverside, uh, we could have, I could have flown to Dubai uh, in about 30 minutes. Uh, we could have had the mm -hmm. chat, had lunch, and they have flown back here and I continue on with my day. So yeah, I mean, to me, I can only dream of that sort of thing happening and hope that it happens soon so I will get to experience that sort of life. Um, it always seems like whatever Elon's doing is a bit like he's ripping a page out of a sci-fi book where I'm like, oh, wow, like, how is he making all of these things happen? And we'll, I, I know I sound like an Elon fan, but when you've seen historically us getting places in space but then i've seen like a dip in the past like you know two three decades and only now very recently has that resurgence sort of picked up and i think whoever's having a conversation elon's always in it and uh have you seen the recent uh three port series that everyday astronaut published about the tour through uh a star base down there I, it's a really neat thing i, uh, I don't know i highly recommend anybody uh, see it but um basically tim dodd uh, the everyday astronaut uh, is with elon musk walking through uh, the facility down there in boca chica texas called uh, starbase and elon mm -hmm. is just uh, kind of walking through his thought process about how he goes about uh, designing systems and pushing things forward one of the things that he mm -hmm. mentions is um you know in his view all requirements should be considered to be dumb like don't accept anything as, as needing to be uh, done. Because sometimes you have these requirements that kind of pile up and people just keep um, moving them forward just because they're on the list of requirements to do. Um, he told a story about, uh, you know, one time at Tesla, there was like this uh, insulator between the battery pack and uh, the actual car. And it was causing so much problems to actually assemble. And uh, he asked the, the battery people, hey, is this for fire suppression? And they're like, no, no, it's for sound reduction. And he asked the body people, they're like, hey, is this for uh, sound uh, suppression? Like, no, 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 it's for uh, fire protection. So both of these teams thought the other team needed this thing, but neither team uh, really mm -hmm. needed it. So it's, you have a lot of situations like that. And uh, he kind of uh, walks through his entire design process. He's, uh, uh, you know, kind of talks a little bit about their plans and future. And it's, it's really exciting to look at. I think that trip that I told you about, by 2030, uh, we could do it. Oh, wow. That's really soon. Yeah. I That's don't think uh, you're going to have to wait uh, a whole other generation or two to, to see this. I think, I think we're talking about a matter of a decade or so. And um, our idea of what's possible will be transformed. That's amazing. Actually, that, uh, that gives me a lot of hope. And in terms of speaking about the next decade, what are some discoveries you're hoping we'll get to find out? I hope we learn how to uh, rejuvenate ourselves. You know, I mean, I, I was just talking to somebody yesterday for my Countdown to the Moon project. And I was like, uh, where do you see humanity in 500 years? And he's like, well, I'll be dead by then. I'm like, is that really a, <laughs> a, a good assumption? I mean, like, uh, well, why do you say that? You know, mm -hmm. that... Don't you think we'll have better medicines and you could actually live for several hundred years? You know, why, why do mm -hmm. we have that mental barrier that uh, we have to die? Uh, so he's like, okay, okay, mm -hmm. maybe we'll have medicines. But then he's like, what's the point? You know, I'll be old and decrepit and I won't be able to walk around. And I'm like, no, no, that's, that's not the point either. The point is, how do you be like 200 and you still have the body of like a 25-year-old, you know? And yeah. uh, I think those rejuvenation technologies that allow for us to not only have the childlike curiosity of um, uh, the people uh, that, you know, you mentioned in your, your uh, intro there, but also have the, the minds and the bodies of, uh, you know, young people as well. I, I mean, there, there's no reason why our bodies should not be, you know, as fit as like 25 year olds. Like, I, I think, I think uh, we can reverse aging and we can you know, regenerate ourselves. I think that's one of the, the big discoveries that I'm looking forward to. And when we do this, uh, people uh, are no longer going to be thinking about uh, kind of like their life cycle, like they do now, like I'm mm -hmm. going to, to, to work and then I'm going to retire and then I'm going to die. 
<laughs> you know, that's kind of like the, yeah. the mental map that I have in my head. And I think a lot of other people have in their head. But what happens whenever that dying thing doesn't happen? And um, also the, the becoming incapacitated thing doesn't happen. And you really can have a life that stretches out long term. I mean, at that point, you know, mm -hmm. uh, a four or five year trip to Mars, uh, you know, ah, that's getting kind of bored here. And, you know, you kind of travel yeah. around the, the world and, you know, you no longer think about uh, life in terms of working and retirement. You think more about and sustained contribution and maybe having many different careers stack, stacked on top of each other. I actually first learned about NASA through encyclopedias I used to read as a young kid. Like this is around when I was four or five years old. I've realized that if NASA's science, like they rewrite textbooks all the time, right? There's stuff that they've discovered that they throw into our science textbooks. What is something you've seen or learned that has the potential to change textbooks for the kids in the future? You know, I, I'm in to IT and computer science and, and programming. Um, I had textbooks in the, the past were, were printed things in, on paper, and then you would be uh, looking at the code and typing it in, uh, and you know, you make a mistake, it doesn't quite work right, or you know, there was some change since the time the um, textbook came out, and you know, the textbook can't be updated. Uh, so now, you know, the ability to create kind of interactive textbooks where it you know, you, you get to interact with the code example as it is uh, on the, the page, you know, without having to type in the whole thing. Uh, also having textbooks where uh, maybe it's like in a, a build your own adventure game, right? Uh, you, you find areas that you're sort of interested in, but not that really. But then there's like this one thing that you really want to deep dive into, uh, being able mm -hmm. to kind of, uh, you know, uh, drill into that thing. So they're able to have like this high level map of these are essential things that you need to get. But then based upon your own interest or, um, you know, your situation, maybe you get a drill into, you know, that second level of deepness, the third level of deepness, you know, and, and at some point you're like, uh, you know, way down at expert level. Um, the ability to enter, you know, kind of um, make textbooks uh, more of a, a kind of a community event. Um, you know, like the role-playing games. I mean, you can imagine, you know, who else is at this point in this textbook write this instead? Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, that's possible now. They're like, I'm really having trouble with this problem. You know, and you're able to say, anybody else having trouble with this problem? Yeah, it makes sense. Like a sort of Dungeons & Dragons adventure where you're both in the same party because you're fighting that boss monster. Exactly. And then, you know, maybe also it's like geocaching, but for textbooks, like you... You know, yeah. everybody's encouraged to leave their own like problem that's related to this, and other people can try like community problems or, uh, mm -hmm. you know, provide comments to each other. Uh, so I've often find when you gamify life, it makes it a lot more interactive, and there's a lot more energy put into solving it because it's fun. It becomes less of a task and more of something you want to do. Yeah, definitely, definitely can. Uh, you also have the the issue of maybe kind of quantifying quantifying it too much too. You know how many points for this and how many points for that, and uh, sometimes that that can mm -hmm. add a, a a layer, a filter on top of it. But uh, yeah, I mean, you know, the thing that kind of uh, I think is another area that we'll have to work on is what people do during their primary and secondary education. Um, mm -hmm. During those periods. It seems like that what students primarily are judged by is how well they can uh, not disrupt the class and how well they can do the assignments that are given. And they're not really, um, I, I feel like the curiosity and, um, you know, kind of the, the practicalities of uh, life are, are kind of so removed from, from their experience. Why don't we have... Uh, kids working on real world projects throughout their life, like a, a school, for example, where it's ran entirely by the, the kids that are going to that school. Like they're the ones that are cooking mm -hmm. the meals. They're the ones that are teaching the lessons, older kids teaching younger kids. Um, they're, they're actually looking at uh, issues in their community and actually addressing them and using the things they learn to actually solve the problems of their community as opposed to it being an abstract uh, problem, you know, and 
the, mm -hmm. the school is really being like, um, you know, a resource for the community. And those kids, I think a lot of kids uh, come out of like high school, for example, uh, feeling like they're not needed or that they have no purpose. And largely that's because mm -hmm. they've been working in isolation and on abstract things that are completely disconnected of everyday life. But the more we could tie them mm -hmm. into the community and say, hey, you can make a contribution. You are needed. You know, I mean, um, I think we need to bring, bring back our, our, I mean, at one point in time, kids were vital to the actual manual production of, of things, you know. Uh, at one point, yep. farms and ranches were like the common thing uh, across America. And kids had chores. They had to milk the cow. They had to feed the cows. They had to, uh, you know, mm -hmm. go and help do the harvest. Uh, you know, they had to go help uh, sell the, uh, the, the produce. They had to fight mm -hmm. uh, the insects and the weeds and, you know, all these things. And, you know, I think it gave them a, a better connection with society than kids who you know, go to daycare and then they go to elementary and then they go to middle school and they go to high school and they're doing all of these kind of uh, abstract things like, um, you know, dealing with math problems about things that they have no experience with to solve problems that have already been solved and constantly reinforcing this idea that the answer is in the back of the book. The answer is in the back of the book. You know, somebody yeah. has the answers. Well, the problems that we need to solve, nobody has the answers to. But the problem is... Um, Problem solving is like a muscle, you know, you kind of, you, you don't go from, mm -hmm. uh, you know, uh, laying in bed for, you know, 18 years and then suddenly you get out and you can go and chop down a forest, right? Uh, you, yep. you have to like actually exercise your problem solving muscles uh, and become stronger to solve the bigger problems. And so what we have is kind of like an interesting dichotomy. The problems that we need to have solved are more complex than anything else that we've ever solved before. The people that mm -hmm. we are producing are more incapable of actually solving even the simplest problem. And so they're, mm -hmm. they're starting to create this gulf. I mean, there's always exceptions yep. to it, but it, it feels like, it feels like there, there should be a way to kind of increase the capabilities of our kids to actually solve problems. So. Yeah, I totally agree. I think from, from my perspective, it seems like the first 18 years of our lives are like the tutorial phase of a game. And then whatever skill set we're supposed to pick up in that tutorial phase has become less and less relevant to our actual game because the game is, has evolved. So, but we're still following the same old patch of that tutorial. So the, I think the tutorial needs an update. And you are definitely hitting the nail on the head when it comes to problem solving. I think of problem solving much like in the same way I think of creativity. It is a muscle and it's, we were all creative and we're all problem solvers when we were born. Right? Ch children are natural explorers. Like you try and touch things, like you touch fire, like, okay, fire, bad, no touch again. But at least like you've explored that, you're thinking big. You're, there's no risk involved. There's no what will happen? What will society think of me? It's more like, hey, I find this interesting. Why don't I try it? You know, what's the worst that could happen? And I think the more you realign your mind to think in that perspective, the easier it gets to reframe situations. And reframing is something super important because it helps you get unstuck in your way of doing things. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, no, that's, that's uh, uh, critical. And, you know, it's like, um, what are the, uh, and I was going to say, you know, that's interesting about um, your first 18 years being a, a tutorial to a game. I think you're right. <laughs> uh, but I would add to that, that it's for a completely different game than you're going to play. It's like you spend 18 years yeah. studying for this game and it's like, okay, well, that's great. You're good at that. Now this is the real game, you know, and they're like completely unrelated exactly. to each other. <laughs> exactly. The game's evolved, right? I mean, if we were still in the industrial age where, you know, whatever you learn in school is for the purpose of making you a good employee to do one specific thing, then yeah, I guess it makes a bit more sense. But today we've solved those issues. Like we have more computational power. So you'll never need to learn how to like condense information as much as create new lines of thought. I think that's more important because if, if there's ever a mass of data, we can just run it through a computer and get the answer quicker and more efficiently with less issues. <laughs> 
um, than you would need a human for. So what's our value compared to a computer's value? We have the creative side and we need to flex that muscle more often and train it so that we can really uh, get the magic from it. Absolutely. And, you know, I think it's so dangerous um, using computer systems that we don't understand and giving them an unwarranted credibility. I think we need to always assume that change is going to happen. And just like yeah. that tutorial was written for an earlier age, um, computer systems are always, to some extent, written for a previous age as well. And a mm -hmm. lot of them can be have value moving forward. And perhaps some of the value actually increases moving forward. But the thing that we got to realize is that um, our situation and the solutions that are embedded in these computer systems uh, aren't always going to be synced up, that we, we need to be conscious of what it is we're getting from the computer. What's the methodology? And does, is that actually solving the problem? We need to always be on the lookout for exceptional situations uh, where, where the computer might be wrong. You know, I, I think there is a place for human judgment, you know, where, where computer systems are just simply one area of input and not the final authority on things. Mm -hmm. Makes sense. And speaking about education, what are some resources, could be YouTube, books, or otherwise, that you'd recommend people to go through in order to learn a bit more about space or space exploration? Uh, that's a good question. I, you know, I really like... Um, you know what uh, the, uh, Tim Dodd's done with the everyday astronaut. So uh, he mm -hmm. has some uh, he has some um, videos that he really walks through, like the the actual engineering behind rockets and how they work. Uh, so that's that's kind of neat. There is this uh, gentleman in uh, Germany actually uh, who has a show that comes out about once or twice a week called What About It, and uh, it's really okay. focused uh, about uh, SpaceX as, as well. Um, the National Space Society, uh, you know, has their uh, kind of like semi-monthly um, magazine called Ad Astra. Uh, it's actually available at, at newsstands now. So that's kind of cool. Um, and Planetary Society, NASA uh, publishes so much online. Uh, so they have lots of resources and depends on when, what your interests are. You know, um, I'm kind of talking about humans on the moon in 2024. But you know, we flew a helicopter on Mars. That was pretty exciting. Yeah. Um, we have uh, probes ar around the sun looking at those solar winds and trying to understand uh, more about the, the sun. We have uh, probes, you know, out beyond the orbit of Pluto that are uh, looking at things. Uh, so, um, and then Earth observation is another thing. I mean, just looking at the global climate change and um, kind of understanding how. Uh, humanity is changing the earth, the surface of the earth, the atmosphere of the earth, the waters of the earth. Uh, you know, these are things that, that NASA, along with several other countries and agencies, is, is uh, studying. So really, really interesting. So lots of resources online. Before I get to our final question, I just want to say a huge thank you for saying yes to coming on the show. I really, really enjoy talking about space and hearing from you, uh, someone who's been involved in this for quite some time now. Um, so just wanted to acknowledge that. For the last question of the day, it's going to be based on the theme of the show, Tell Me. Now I'd like you to tell us, with all of your adventures and learning more about space and space exploration, what is one piece of advice or knowledge you'd like to leave us with? One piece of uh, advice and, and knowledge. I, I would say, you know, we really need to, to question our lives and sort of like the routines that we're on. Uh, going through our, our values and everything. I think, you know, so so much of our our lives we've inherited from our parents, from our society, from our friends. And it's very easy to kind of um, sleepwalk through life accepting certain things. You can't question everything. There's just too much energy for that. But you could definitely question some of the things. Uh, you know, why do I have the job that I, I do? What am I learning? Am I mm -hmm. making a contribution? Am I uh, developing stronger relationships with each other? Am I spending my energies on things that I actually can make a difference with? 
or am I just wasting my energies on things that I'm not going to be making a difference with? Like uh, here mm-hmm. in the U.S., national politics uh, has absorbed so much energy uh, from across uh, the the population. But in reality, you know, we're all just sort of netting out each other. If we took that same energy and, and spent it on our house or spent it on our street or spent it on our community, uh, we could live in better houses and better streets with better communities. You know, getting into a, um, a conversation with somebody on, on Facebook about this issue or that issue, at the end of the day, the issue hasn't changed. You probably haven't changed yeah. your mind. You're probably worn out and exhausted and upset. Uh, but if you took that same energy and, uh, say, went and planted some flowers or trees or went to go help, um, you know, your, your neighborhood uh, baseball team uh, practice or uh, went to go paint a building or, you know, clean up uh, trash from a street, you know, you actually did something with your time. It may feel small, but it was mm-hmm. real and it was a lot better than uh, achieving zero uh, that you, you, you probably would by talking about that issue with somebody on Facebook. So I, I think that's the, the number one. Don't waste your energy. Uh, use it on something uh, that's important to you and um, focus on getting stuff done. Uh, don't, you don't need to convince everybody. You just need to convince enough people mm-hmm. to make it happen, right? And you, you, only, yeah. you only work with the willing. <laughs> work with the willing. Thank you, everybody, for listening so far. And we'll catch you next time on the Tell Me series. 